Hello, I'm Bill Curtis for Investigative Reports. In the 29 years since the assassination of President John F. Kennedy, polls indicate we have become a nation of conspiracy theorists. Unfortunately, we don't know which conspiracy to believe, if any. In 1964, the Warren Commission told us that Lee Harvey Oswald acted alone. In 1979, the House Assassinations Committee said there was probably a conspiracy, but they couldn't prove it. Along the way, we've been treated to theories about the Mafia, the CIA, Cuban exiles, and much more. And then came Oliver Stone and his movie JFK, which told us another story. That the assassination was really a coup d'etat against a president who wanted to avoid war in Vietnam. In the latest twist, the CIA now says it's prepared to release some of its files on the assassination. In the next hour, we'll try to guide you through this conspiracy crossfire as we raise questions about the murder mystery of the century. The President of the United States is dead. I think this is the man that killed the President. I didn't shoot anybody, sir. I haven't been told. Giving us their perspectives are former President Gerald Ford, the only surviving member of the Warren Commission, film director Oliver Stone, former chief counsel of the House Assassinations Committee, Professor Robert Blakey, British journalist Anthony Summers, author of an award-winning book about the assassination called Conspiracy, and Judge Bert Griffin, a former Warren Commission lawyer who says the CIA lied to the commission. There is no consensus among them, nor any easy answers to the question, who killed JFK? We know the footage all too well. And yet, because as a nation, we have never made peace with the answers we've been given, we somehow cannot resist reliving the nightmare. Who can watch the President and Mrs. Kennedy get off the plane in Dallas and not feel the familiar dread? 29 years later, and we still want to holler across the decades and tell the president to turn around, get back on the plane. Who can watch the motorcade wind toward Dealey Plaza and not wish there were a way to divert the limousine down another street, away from the Texas School Book Depository, the grassy knoll, and the magic bullet? Then, suddenly it's too late. The limousine has entered the viewfinder of an 8mm camera held by Abraham Zapruder, who records the most shocking home movie of all time. President Kennedy has been assassinated. It's official now. The president is dead. Soon after the assassination, Dallas police arrest Lee Harvey Oswald, a 24-year-old ex-Marine. He is charged with murdering a police officer and assassinating the president. I do request uh, for someone to come forward to give me uh, a legal assistance. Less than 48 hours later, with a nation mourning its slain leader. Oswald is shot and killed in the basement of the Dallas police station by nightclub owner Jack Ruby. Deprived of a trial against Oswald, we're left instead with nagging mysteries. Was he the assassin? Was there a plot? The Former President Gerald Ford believes the central mystery was solved long ago. But with the conclusions and even the motives of the Warren Commission under attack these days, especially from Oliver Stone's movie JFK, Mr. Ford met with us in order to defend his view that the Warren Commission has been right all along. The Warren Commission identified Lee Harvey Oswald as the assassin. We identified the rifle that was used to uh, shoot uh, President Kennedy. We identified the bullets that hit President Kennedy. So there's no doubt whatsoever in my mind that uh, Lee Harvey Oswald was the assassin. What would the motive have been of Lee Harvey Oswald? I'm not sure that uh, anybody can come up with a categorical answer. I don't know why Squeaky Fromm tried to assassinate me in Sacramento. I don't know why uh, Sarah Jane Moore in San Francisco tried to assassinate me. I don't know why Hinckley tried to assassinate uh, President Reagan. 
There's no question that Lee Harvey Oswald was mentally unstable. He had a very bad marriage. He was often taunted by his wife for his lack of success in uh, any career. He was taunted by his wife by his sexual impotence. Uh, he had a, a strange uh, experience in the Soviet Union, all his strange activities down in New Orleans. He was a strange person. But if so, did Oswald act alone? Robert Blakey was chief counsel for the House Assassinations Committee. He thinks the mob ordered the president's death. They had the motive to do it, and they, had, they were of the character that they would do it. Uh, the only question is whether they did. And certainly as to Carlos Marcello and Santos Traficante, there's a substantial reason to believe that they did. These were powerful men who were routinely used to killing people who got in their way. And John and Robert Kennedy were most certainly in their way. British journalist and assassination investigator Anthony Summers sees a plot involving several groups. Sometimes people sort of glaze over about the notion uh, that the mob, the mafia, and US intelligence and the anti-Castro activists were involved together in the assassination of President Kennedy. In fact, there's no contradiction there those three groups were all in bed together at the time and had been for several years in the fight to topple Fidel Castro. Bert Griffin is an Ohio trial court judge who served on the Warren Commission staff. He supports its findings, but he's angry that the CIA never told the commission about its secret efforts to assassinate Castro. Of course, they had never told us that. Uh, and in fact, they had denied uh, that that rumor which we were aware of was true. And so we operated and we carried out our investigation on the assumption that there was no truth in this. Um, I was uh, angered, uh, angry over the fact that uh, we had been lied to. Film director Oliver Stone thinks he knows why the government never found the full truth. The government has no interest in solving this case, because ultimately the trail leads back to itself. Oswald, Ruby, Cuba, the Mafia, keeps them guessing like some kind of parlor game, prevents them from asking the most important question, why? Why was Kennedy killed? Who benefited? Who has the power to cover it up? Before we examine those theories, let's return to Dealey Plaza. After the assassination, some people said they had heard gunfire from the book depository. President Ford relies on the testimony of Howard Brennan, who said he saw someone shoot from the sixth floor window. He immediately after the shots were fired went to the police and gave a description a description which in retrospect was very very close to the identification of Lee Harvey Oswald you have to take into account the testimony of Arnold Rowland and his wife Rowland looked up we showed it in the film and he said he saw two uh, riflemen up on the sixth floor one on the west end and one on the east end and he thought they were Secret Service he went to the FBI that weekend to report on there being a second, uh, second rifleman up on the sixth floor. And the, and the FBI told him, forget it. Others heard shots from the grassy knoll to the right of the president's limousine. There's a fence up on the grassy knoll, and there were people standing right in front of it. And a couple of them were people with uh, either hunting experience or experience in, in war, in Korea. And they, they described the shots as being the sort of sounds they'd heard in action themselves of a really loud boom, boom, an explosion right behind them. And um, there were witnesses who saw smoke rising by the fence. Amid the chaos, a Dallas patrolman raced up the grassy knoll and around the fence. J.D. Smith, a patrol officer, came behind the fence with his gun drawn and he met someone coming out from behind the fence who showed him, he thought, Secret Service credentials. We made an effort to determine where all of the Secret Service agents on the detail were. None were on the ground uh, in Dealey Plaza. That mystery, like so many others, has never been solved. By far the most objective piece of evidence is the Zapruder film. At first we see the president waving. Then he disappears behind a road sign. When he emerges, he's already been shot once. His fists are clenched, held up near his throat. We also see Governor Connolly turning toward the back of the car. And then also shot 
slumping down in his seat. This presented a problem to the Warren Commission. How could a lone gunman have shot Kennedy and Connolly almost simultaneously? The answer? It was the same bullet, the highly controversial so-called magic bullet. President Ford told us he still supports the single bullet theory. There's no question that the first bullet went cleanly through the neck of President Kennedy. And if you look at where Governor Connolly was sitting in the jump seat, right in front of President Kennedy, it was very possible that that first bullet, not hitting any bone, could go through the neck and go into the body of Governor Connolly. How can you justify the same bullet going through Kennedy, hitting him low, six inches below his shoulder blade, going up through his neck, pausing for 1.5 or 6 seconds, and then going into Connolly, and then doing the damage it did to Con Connolly, breaking two bones, causing seven wounds, and coming out pristine in a hospital corridor five miles away? How do you justify that? A moment later, the right side of Kennedy's head explodes in a halo of blood and brain tissue. The president is thrown back and to the left. This fatal headshot has also been the subject of intense controversy. The supposed lone gunman is behind the president in the book depository. While common sense might say, the film is showing us a shot from the front. But as with the magic bullet, that's not what most of the experts told the Warren Commission. Some describe the backward movement as a neuromuscular reaction to a massive head wound. Then there is the disputed autopsy evidence. We have photographs of his skull. We have x-rays of his skull. The photographs of his skull show an entry wound in the back and an exit wound in the front. Now the autopsy really was a shambles. The people who were used to do it were not doctors used to dealing with gunshot wounds. In the end, the Warren Commission concluded that Oswald fired three shots from the book depository. But in 1979, the House Assassinations Committee dealt with new evidence. A routine recording of police radio traffic had apparently picked up the sounds of four shots. The four sounds appear to match what we see on the Zapruder film. The committee concluded that the third shot was fired by another gunman from the grassy knoll and missed the president. The conclusion that flows from what happened in the plaza is that there were two shooters. Not one, two shooters. And when you have two shooters, you have, in all likelihood, a conspiracy. Scientists have disputed the meaning of that police tape. There is also the perplexing question of where, within the book depository, Oswald actually was at the time of the shooting, which occurred at 12.30 in the afternoon. Two individuals saw him uh, before the shooting in the first floor lunchroom. Uh, then uh, Carolyn Arnold, as we showed in the film, saw him uh, around 12.15, maybe even a little later, up on the second floor uh, snack room. The president was due to go by at 12.25. Surely it is unlikely that Oswald would have been sitting downstairs in the lunchroom around 12.15, 12.20. That's consistent with a man who was ambivalent about what he was going to do. Uh, that if the opportunity presented himself, he was going to do it. But I'm not sure that, that he was even certain up until the very last minute that he was going to pull this off. That raises difficult questions about Oswald's character and his background. When we return, who was Lee Harvey Oswald? And if he shot the president, what could his motive have been? In a moment, you're on A&E. mistake was made. Okay, we forgot. We overlooked it. Say you need something said overnight. There are a few companies you can call, but say you need it Saturday morning, guaranteed. There are two. 
but only one is so efficient. Bobby, just give me a couple of minutes. They get to there on time for far less, which is why to some, right. there is only one UPS. Two minutes, Gary. Yeah, you do my shoes. Let's go. Let's go. Let's go. Let's go. Let's go. Let's go. The testing lasted two years and yielded gasolines that are clearly advanced. Exxon offers you phase four. Gasolines that give you the highest level of engine cleaning in every unleaded grade for smooth acceleration and maximum performance. For a cleaner engine and high performance, rely on phase four from Exxon. Gillette presents Sensor, the system, the technology that will change the way you shave forever. Sensor, twin blades set on springs to read your face and respond. Independent suspension to sense and adjust to every curve of your face. No other razor comes close. Gillette Sensor, for the best shave a man can get. We now continue with Who Killed JFK? We advocate restoration of diplomatic, trade, and tourist relations with Cuba. The mystery about Lee Harvey Oswald has endured. Was he really the bitter pro-Castro Marxist portrayed by the Warren Commission? He was a terrible eccentric. He always got tied up with some screwball organization, whether it was in New Orleans or when he went to Soviet Union or when he went to Mexico City. He was a nut, an absolute nut. And uh, so in the course of the Warren Commission examination or investigation, we checked out all of the things that he was involved in where he might have had some Cuban Castro connection, and uh, we found no credible evidence. Some conspiracy theories suggest Oswald was only posing as a leftist while in fact he was involved with U.S. intelligence and right-wing anti-Castro groups. Judge Griffin says stories about Oswald's childhood show his beliefs were genuine. Uh, one of them is uh, that when he was a high school student, uh, he was thrown out of his high school astronomy club because he got in an argument people, with people and he was espousing Marxism. Now, 16 years old is a little bit early for the CIA to start recruiting their agents. But there's another element in Oswald's background, according to Chief Counsel Blakey you can immediately uh, connect Lee Harvey Oswald uh, to the mob. Lee Harvey Oswald grew up in New Orleans. Uh, his surrogate uncle was a man named Dutz Moret. Uh, Dutz Moret is a bookmaker who worked in the chain of books uh, controlled by uh, uh, Carlos Marcello. At the time, Carlos Marcello was considered the most powerful mafia boss in the South. About Oswald's early life, one thing is clear. After high school, he spent three years in the Marines. During that time, he worked in the radar room at the Atsugi Air Base in Japan, home to the U-2 spy plane. He was a bright man. Uh, he had an IQ of 115. He learned to speak Russian. Anybody who tries to learn to speak it knows how difficult it is. Oswald received a discharge from the Marines in 1959. Then he suddenly defected to the Soviet Union. He announced to the U.S. Embassy in Moscow that he planned to divulge military secrets, the Soviets sent him off to work in a television factory in Minsk. By 1962, Oswald was apparently disenchanted with life in Russia, so he and his new wife Marina and their baby daughter left the Soviet Union for good and moved to Dallas. Is there more to the story than that? Author Anthony Summers thinks there is indeed. When he returned to the United States, according to the intelligence authorities, he was not questioned seriously, wasn't debriefed, and was simply allowed to this guy who at the height of the Cold War, had gone to the Soviet Union, um, saying that he was going to give away American secrets, was allowed to come home to the United States with his Soviet wife and quietly go home to Texas. It just doesn't wash. But are you a Marxist? I think you did admit on an earlier radio interview that you, uh, that you consider yourself a Marxist. Well, I would very definitely say that I, uh, I uh, am a Marxist. That is correct. But that, that does not mean, however, that I'm a, a uh, communist. To make sense of the Oswald story and the conspiracy theories built around him, it's useful to refresh some history. At the time, Castro's Cuba was a major focus of Cold War tension. President Kennedy's first crisis was the Bay of Pigs disaster. 1,500 CIA-backed Cuban exiles tried to invade Cuba. They were quickly defeated. 
The president felt betrayed by the CIA. He vowed privately that he would smash the agency into a thousand pieces. He fired CIA director and future Warren Commission member Alan Dulles. After the Bay of Pigs, the president launched a secret war against Cuba, which included a series of bizarre plots to assassinate Castro. This government, as promised, has maintained the closest surveillance of the Soviet military buildup on the island of Cuba. But after the Cuban Missile Crisis the following year, Kennedy abruptly called off the secret war. This last move infuriated anti-Castro rebels in the U.S. Now they felt betrayed by Kennedy. All the while, the president's brother was waging another kind of war on the domestic front against organized crime. At that time, Professor Blakey worked in the Justice Department with Attorney General Robert Kennedy. The FBI and the Department of Justice was on the mob like whites on rice. They had never had this kind of pressure before. Repeatedly complained about it, uh, said that uh, they had contributed to the president's election in stealing the election in, in Chicago, uh, that they had provided the president with other services, which we need not detail the details of, uh, and resented both the president and Robert Kennedy on a personal level because of the organized crime uh, program. In fact, about a year before the assassination, Florida mob boss Santos Traficante allegedly told an FBI informant that President Kennedy was, quote, going to be hit, unquote. Meantime, back in Texas, Lee Harvey Oswald's marriage was falling apart. He was having trouble holding a job. In March of 1963, mail-order documents show that Oswald purchased a Manlicker Carcano 6.5-millimeter rifle and a Smith & Wesson 38 caliber revolver. The rifle would be found after the assassination in the book depository, and the revolver was allegedly used by Oswald to kill Officer J.D. Tippett that same day. The weapons were purchased in the name of A. Hadell, the nickname of one of Oswald's Marine buddies. Well, it certainly is a strong bolstering of the Warren Commission uh, findings. After all, the person uh, who uh, uh, acquired the rifle from a Chicago mail order house was the same person who acquired the revolver that was used in shooting Officer Tibbet. In April of 63, Oswald returned to New Orleans and took a job with his uncle, the bookmaker. The following month, he decided to open a one-man branch office of the Pro-Castro Fair Play for Cuba Committee. That summer, Oswald held his own Pro-Castro demonstrations and handed out leaflets. But when we look more closely at this, uh, we find that he was printing these leaflets and um, associating with people in an office in the middle of New Orleans, which was in fact filled with anti-Castro activists and run by a man called Bannister, who was a former FBI guy now involved with U.S. intelligence in the war against Fidel Castro. Uh, one of the most striking interviews I did was with Bannister's secretary, uh, who told me that Oswald came to that office, met with Bannister in his office, and was then given a place to work in the building to prepare his pro-Castro leaflets. And her boss, Bannister, uh, with his associations with U.S. intelligence, told her flatly that Oswald was working as some kind of undercover agent for them. What do we make of that? What do we make then of the notion that Oswald was a genuine pro-Castro uh, agitator? The suggestion is that Oswald was being manipulated by anti-Castro elements, Others believe the opposite, that Oswald, the genuine Marxist, was trying to spy on the anti-Castro office as part of his own plan to live in Cuba. I think what Oswald was trying to do in New Orleans uh, was gather enough information that would enable him uh, to have something marketable to, to persuade the Cubans that they ought to let him come and live in Cuba. And the way, the way to do that was to get information about Castro's enemies. Yet another mystery about Oswald is his relationship with a man named David Ferry. Ferry was an anti-Castro activist and alleged CIA operative. He worked in New Orleans for Mafia leader Carlos Marcello. There are ample uh, uh, sightings of Lee Harvey Oswald and David Ferry that summer. Shortly after the assassination, uh, David Ferry was informed by Carlos Marcello's lawyer that uh, 
his library card had been found on Oswald. There's no corroboration that in fact it was, but David Ferry took the allegation serious enough. He believed it, that he went by Oswald's rooming house, and we talked to the, the, the lady that ran it, and she specifically remembers David Ferry coming by looking for the card. In September of 63, Oswald traveled by bus to Mexico City. The Warren Commission says he went to the Cuban embassy there and tried to get a visa, but was turned away. Some say this was really an imposter using Oswald's name. It is there in Mexico City that Robert Blakey believes anti-Castro Cubans hired by the mob approached Oswald. All they had to do is oppose, oppose as pro-Castro when they were anti-Castro uh, and seek out Lee Harvey Oswald. They knew his attitudes. They knew what he was and enlist him in a conspiracy to kill the president on behalf of Castro. There's not a word of a suggestion that Oswald thought anything ill at all of John Kennedy. And no one has come even close to thinking of a, a motive for this man to kill him. As a seasoned prosecutor, I'll tell you, Lee Harvey Oswald could be and would have been convicted of killing John Kennedy beyond a reasonable doubt. The Kennedy assassination is the most analyzed murder of all time. Yet neither the Warren Commission in the 60s nor the House Assassinations Committee in the late 70s was able to put the case to rest. Just the opposite. Each investigation sparked new controversies. More on that in a moment here on a &E. The car world wants headlines. They like quicker, quieter, roomier. But this new S-Class isn't that simple. You see, there are so many advances in this car that affect so many things. Handling, structural strengths, performance, durability, reliability. Although I have to say, it is very quick. It is very roomy. It is very quiet. Something, something new. A Nicoderm patch. Nicotine transdermal system. Yeah, it's called Nicoderm. Oh, yeah. Yeah, the patch. Right, it's a patch. Nicoderm. It's new. A lot of people don't know about it. You know, maybe I'll ask my doctor. Nicoderm. It's a patch, huh? Yeah, it's a patch. The Nicoderm patch. Ask your doctor about it. One of history's cruelest twists of fate, the failed plan to stop a madman. David L. Wolper presents The Plot to Murder Hitler, Monday on A&E. This is your invitation to enter the world of arts and entertainment magazine. Here you'll discover thought-provoking authors, reviews of the finest in performing arts and literature, highlights from the latest in music, home videos, and motion pictures, and in-depth profiles of today's most intriguing personalities. All the drama, the wonder, the beauty you've come to expect from the A&E Network can be found in Arts and Entertainment magazine. Plus beautiful color photography, challenging crossword puzzles. And an expanded, improved program guide that takes you behind the scenes of the best in television. To receive your 12 monthly issues for only $18 a year, send a check or money order to Arts and Entertainment Magazine, P.O. Box 2071, Knoxville, Iowa, 50197-2071. Or use your credit card and call toll-free 1-800-238. We now continue with Who Killed JFK? The world will never know the true facts of what occurred. When Jack Ruby murdered Lee Harvey Oswald in the Dallas police station, the question immediately arose, was Ruby hired to silence Oswald? The Warren Commission concluded Ruby was not part of a conspiracy. There have been allegations that... Uh... Ruby, for example, had some uh, connections with organized crime. But in the interview or interrogation of Jack Ruby by uh, Chief Justice Warren and myself, we asked him, did you uh, murder uh, Lee Harvey Oswald because of any mob connections? He said no. We asked him, did you murder Lee Harvey Oswald because of any foreign connection. He adamantly said no. Jack Ruby, for a substantial period of time, 
was not a member of the mafia, but an associate of mafia figures and involved in various mafia uh, activities. Shortly before the assassination, he was in deep financial problem, trouble. There, he was, it, this was known to the mob figures with which he dealt. He was a natural candidate to select for the silencing of Oswald. The House Assassinations Committee also found that Ruby had numerous phone conversations with major mob figures in the weeks leading up to the assassination, and that Ruby was pursuing Oswald almost from the moment Kennedy was shot. Jack Ruby got a phone call in his apartment uh, the day of the assassination. He went and got his 38. He went to the police station, and he was observed by officers trying to enter the room where Lee Harvey Oswald was being interrogated. He was sent away from there. Uh, that night, there was a press conference. Still carrying his 38, he was present at the press conference where Oswald was going to be. The press conference was aborted. The following afternoon, Oswald was supposed to be moved at 4 o'clock. Jack Ruby was seen in and around the garage or basement at 3. That's the third time he was in and around a public viewing of Oswald. On Sunday morning, uh, he, of course, killed uh, Lee Harvey Oswald. Uh, that he got to him accidentally, serendipitously that morning, uh, is a fact. But it was the fourth time he made an effort to do it. Accordingly, it looked to us like he was stalking him. Many investigators believe Chief Justice Earl Warren made a crucial mistake when he ignored Ruby's plea to be brought to Washington. Ruby claimed his life was in danger in Dallas, and he could not speak freely. Now, these people are in very high positions, Jack. Yes. I wish, uh, in my heart of hearts, that the Chief Justice had paid attention uh, to what uh, Jack Ruby said and taking him to Washington, taking him out of the custody of the Dallas PD uh, or the Sheriff's Department and got him into the custody of the United States Marshals who could have protected him, we might have learned uh, then uh, the truth about Ruby's connection uh, uh, to the assassination. Studying Jack Ruby was part of Bert Griffin's job on the Warren Commission. He does not believe Ruby was a conspirator. Rather, he thinks Ruby saw himself as the first conspiracy researcher. Ruby was obsessed with the idea that Kennedy was killed as a part of an anti-Semitic plot. He believed that it was a part of, of an effort to blame the assassination on the Jews of America. He got this idea because on the morning that Kennedy was assassinated, the Dallas Morning News ran a full-page, black-bordered advertisement, highly critical of President Kennedy, and signed with the name Bernard Weissman. Uh, Weissman uh, seemed to, to Ruby to be a Jewish name. He did not know Bernard Weissman. He'd never heard of him. Uh, the Dallas Jewish community was relatively small. Ruby thought he knew everybody in Dallas who was Jewish. He then spent the next 36 hours trying to find Weissman. After Ruby shot Oswald and was wrestled to the floor of the Dallas police station and taken up on the fifth floor to be interrogated, the first person who talked to him was Forrest Sorrells, a Secret Service agent. And when Sorrells asked Ruby why he did it, Ruby's answer was, I had to show the world that you had guts. On the other hand, if investigators can connect Oswald to Ruby somehow, the story is more sinister. Could David Ferry and Carlos Marcello be the link? David Ferry uh, met with Carlos Marcello uh, in, the, in the weeks before the assassination regularly. The, the ostensible explanation was to prepare uh, uh, Carlos Marcello for his criminal trial. Carlos Marcello was on trial on November the 22nd. Immediately after that trial, David Ferry uh, drove through a storm some 300 miles into Houston and Galveston, Texas, allegedly to go ice skating. The testimony is that he didn't skate on ice. He made a series of long-distance phone calls from Galveston. One of the calls was back to the town and country motel where Carlos Marcello had his headquarters. The other calls correspond in time to the point at which Jack Ruby was receiving phone calls. What I'm suggesting to you is that if you have two shooters in the plaza and, it wa and it's therefore likely a conspiracy, the associations of, of Lee Harvey Oswald and Jack Ruby that overlap are associations that tie into organized crime. 
Unfortunately, the information developed about Marcello by the House Assassinations Committee in the late 1970s was not seriously pursued by the U.S. Justice Department. Am I disappointed in that? Yes, I am outraged that the investigation was conducted in that fashion. Is it too late now? Yes, it's too late. Warren Commission Counsel Bert Griffin was also outraged by the way the CIA treated his written requests for information about Ruby, Oswald, and others beginning in March 1964. One would have expected a response back in a couple of weeks, at the longest. Uh, but a couple of months went by, and I got no response. Another letter was sent, and I got no response. Finally, uh, in the midsummer of 1964, uh, they did respond, and they said that they had no further information on all of these people. They never called the CIA to task, and they never investigated them because they were cowed by them. They were cowed by the FBI. President Ford told us that by 1963, he in fact did know about the CIA efforts to assassinate Fidel Castro. The commission investigators, such as Bert Griffin, were never informed of this. To withhold that from the commission, do you think that was proper? I don't think uh, it had any adverse impact. Uh, as I said, my committee assignments had been such that I had all that background, and certainly Alan Dulles, who was the former head of the CIA uh, in the 50s and early 60s, uh, had ample knowledge of whatever the CIA was doing in, involved in uh, uh, attempted assassinations. Given Lee Harvey Oswald's bewildering contacts with anti-Castro activists, the very groups which felt betrayed by Kennedy over Cuba, the CIA's assassination efforts would certainly have been of great interest to Bert Griffin. Griffin now wonders what else of possible relevance to the Kennedy assassination the CIA also withheld and might still be withholding. The bottom line is that once somebody has lied to you once about an important matter, uh, the question is, can you trust them again about important matters? And I think that's the difficulty that the CIA has placed itself in. And, and let's face it, the CIA has to wear the jacket on this. Conspiracy theorists have leveled a further charge about Mr. Ford's private meetings with the FBI at the time the Warren Commission was conducting its investigation. The accusation is based on memos written by FBI Congressional Liaison Officer C.D. Deloach. And he says, I had a long talk this morning with Congressman Jerry Ford. He asked that I come up to see him. Upon arriving, he told me he wanted to talk in the strictest of confidence. Ford told me he was somewhat disturbed about the manner in which Chief Justice Warren was carrying on his chairmanship of the Presidential Commission. And later on in the document, Ford um, gives them, gives the FBI his assurance that they would keep the FBI thoroughly advised as to the activities of the Commission. Gerald Ford was the FBI's spy on the commission. Ford denies the charge and recounts a different story about his relationship with the FBI official who wrote that memo. When I became a member of the Warren Commission, uh, he would drop by and he would ask if I could give him any information. I never gave him any confidential information. But let me say this, uh, people who represented J. Edgar Hoover on the hill were always anxious to go back to their boss and embellish their uh, responsibilities or their actions. You know, they could go back to the FBI headquarters and tell Mr. Hoover, well, I did this and I did that. A little puffing. That's human nature. And I, I think that's what uh, Mr. Deloche did. But I think it's a much more valid question would be, what is the FBI really telling the Warren Commission? I would be much more interested in the information going the other way from the FBI to the commission. We're talking about our government here. No, we're talking about a crime bill, pure and simple. Oliver Stone's movie, JFK, not only rekindled interest in the Kennedy assassination, it also infuriated people who think Stone had no right to splice together facts and fiction. When we return, separating the evidence from the speculation. This new S-Class is so many things. Space, strength, and safety, of course. But more than anything else, it's the performance that will astonish people. Because it's so quick, so agile. 
If you don't love driving this car, maybe you just don't like driving. Gillette presents Sensor, the system, the technology that will change the way you shave forever. Sensor, twin blades set on springs to read your face and respond. Independent suspension to sense and adjust to every curve of your face. No other razor comes close. Gillette Sensor, for the best shave a man can get. There's a fine line between cop and criminal. You never gave drugs to informants. Danny Cello crossed that line. Every no. detective that ever worked in SIU, Danny, is going to jail. I will never wear a wire against cops with my friends or partners in SIU. Nobody can give us up for each other. Treat Williams and Jerry Orbach. I will not give up my partners. Based on a true story, Sidney Lamette's searing indictment of police corruption and the conspiracy of silence. My partners would never give me up. Prince of the City, tonight on A&E. I'm alive, Jeff Hashimoto. I'm alive, Rhonda Williamson. I'm alive, Sonia Schofield. I'm alive, Howard Weber. Want to get more out of life? I'm alive, Jessica Weber. Get airbags. See your Allstate agent for a list of cars with airbags. We're alive. This is your invitation to enter the world of Arts and Entertainment magazine. Here you'll discover thought-provoking authors, reviews from the world of the arts, and profiles of today's most intriguing personalities. Plus our expanded and improved program guide will take you behind the scenes of the best in television. To receive your 12 monthly issues of Arts and Entertainment magazine, call toll-free 1-800-238-2800. Have your credit card handy when you call. We now continue with Who Killed JFK? Just maybe Oswald is exactly what he said he was. A pansy. Oliver Stone's movie JFK is clearly responsible for the current surge of interest in the assassination of President Kennedy. JFK follows the crusade of Jim Garrison, the former district attorney of New Orleans. In 1967, Garrison brought a trial against a prominent local businessman. Garrison accused Clay Shaw of conspiring to assassinate Kennedy. The jury took less than an hour to find Shaw not guilty. Nonetheless, Stone uses the Garrison story to demonstrate his belief that a conspiracy originated somewhere within the high ranks of government. This was a military-style ambush from start to finish. This was a coup d'etat with Lyndon Johnson waiting in the wings. It's a small paramilitary operation. It involves up to five to maybe ten men, maybe twelve men. That's been misrepresented. They, you know, they, they ridicule me and say that the film is two thousand people are involved in killing Kennedy. I never said that in the movie. I show one phone call coming from a high-level person to a mid-level person saying it's on in the south in the fall. Organize it, basically. It will perhaps come as no surprise to Mr. Stone that the single issue which united our other four interviewees was their passionate disdain for his film and its hero. Uh, Garrison is a discredited prosecutor from New Orleans who alleges that there were three uh, gunmen who fired six shots. But uh, Jim Garrison has not identified a single person who fired a shot. Garrison has not identified a single weapon that was used at any time. And Jim Garrison has not found a single bullet that hit or was fired at President Kennedy. Instead of taking Garrison's charges seriously, which is what they should have done, the press attacked him and destroyed him. But they should have gone after the things that he was raising. It is appropriate that his name is Stone. The Bible suggests that those who would scandalize the young, and that's what he's doing, when half the people in this country do not remember the assassination and all that they will know is what they see in that movie, those people ought to have stones hung around their neck and thrown into the sea. Metaphorically, that's precisely what ought to happen to Oliver Stone. Nothing was left to chance. He could not be allowed to escape alive. I think they did pull it off, and I think they're gone for the most part, and they, it worked. 
We had the Vietnam War. We, had, we, re, we returned to the Cold War. We spent trillions of dollars. A lot of people got rich. And it was a successful coup d'etat. Well, I could sit here and theorize that uh, President Kennedy was killed uh, by, one, by a jealous mistress with a bow and arrow. Uh, well, at least there'd be some cause for that, because he certainly had a lot of mistresses. But there isn't a shred of evidence that any of those mistresses killed the president. Um, and there certainly isn't any evidence at all that it had anything to do with Vietnam. And who killed the president? It's, it's a mystery. It's a mystery wrapped in a riddle inside an enigma. The shooters don't even know. Don't you get it? What have I done that's so evil in comparison to what the Warren Commission has done? I have created, I think, a counter myth. I have a certain body of facts beyond which I speculate. But my myth, I think, is closer to the truth than their myth. The Warren Commission was not a myth, but I'll accept it for the purpose of argument. The Warren Commission was a myth, therefore he has a right to create a second myth. Is that what a search for the truth is all about? Oh, come President come Ford takes particular offense at the charge that the Warren Commission conspired to suppress information that might have proven that Oswald did not act alone. Could the mob get the FBI, the CIA, and the Dallas police to make a mess of the investigation? I mean, could the mob get the Wall Commission appointed to cover it up? This idea that the seven of us were part of a conspiracy is hogwash. Hogwash. We serve because the President of the United States urged us to do it as a public service. And we did. And now to have all these carping critics come up without any new credible evidence, to be honest with you, it does bother me. Look, at, uh, from the day I joined the Warren Commission staff, I wanted to find a conspiracy. If I could have found a conspiracy, uh, I'd be the senator from Ohio today, not John Glenn or Howard Metzenbaum. Uh, I'd have been a national hero, and every other member of our staff recognized that for himself. Um, so we started out with a hope that we could find something more than the FBI had found. And I understand the feelings of other people who want to find it. And I, I think in many ways that's a commendable attitude. Uh, we should all be here to find the truth. But as time goes on, I, I certainly become more and more convinced that the truth is basically what the Warren Commission found. I don't know what Burke Griffin's talking about. I mean, he did not investigate this case thoroughly. They, if they had, they would have started with the CIA and the FBI, and they would have made these people deal with them honestly. They would have gone into those files and, and conducted a thorough homicide investigation. CIA and the mafia working together, trying to whack out the beard, mutual interest. They've been doing it for years. There's more this than you could dream. I wish the person with all the talent of Oliver Stone would have uh, taken a, an objective, balanced, unbiased uh, uh, effort in order to portray what transpired in November of 1963 in Dallas. The movie has served a public purpose in that it's brought together in one place all the, uh, I think, pertinent counter information to the Warren Commission. Stone's movie has in fact generated enormous pressure on the government to finally release all documents on the Kennedy assassination. The CIA now says it's willing to declassify some of its assassination documents. That might shed new light on Oswald's defection to the Soviet Union and his mysterious trip to Mexico City. But will we ever solve the case? More on that when we return, here on a &E. The testing lasted two years and yielded gasolines that are clearly advanced. Exxon offers you Phase 4. Gasolines that give you the highest level of engine cleaning in every unleaded grade for smooth acceleration and maximum performance. For a cleaner engine and high performance, rely on Phase 4 from Exxon. Having embarked on a new career at the age of 45, Kareem found himself traveling in coach. At least his hands were comfortable. Only PowerBook is designed to fit the way you work. PowerBook from Apple.
as long as they keep making history, we'll keep writing their biographies. Peter Graves hosts the landmark television series, Biography, the stories of extraordinary lives. Tuesday, only on A&E. There's 20 new reasons to visit Disney World this year. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve, thirteen, fourteen, fifteen, sixteen, seventeen, eighteen, nineteen, twenty. One more time! One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve, thirteen, fourteen, fifteen, sixteen, seventeen, eighteen, nineteen, twenty. Call one four zero seven W Disney now. We now continue with Who Killed JFK? President Kennedy was laid to rest on Monday, November 25th, 1963. A funeral, like a trial for murder, is an imperfect human ritual, an attempt to reconcile ourselves with death. But insofar as there has been no conclusive trial for the assassination of John F. Kennedy, this was really a death without a funeral, a killing without a trial. The Warren Commission was an effort to give us uh, a substitute, a surrogate for that trial. Uh, unfortunately, it has not worked. One reason it has not worked, say the critics, is that until recently, the CIA and FBI have opposed the release of assassination documents. It remains to be seen what might now be made public. President Ford says it's time to free the files. You've seen those files. Will they shed any light? Nothing very credible that would undercut the Warren Commission. There's no doubt that there will be some unsubstantiated allegations by individuals about somebody else. And that's always a danger, Bill. When you take raw data where people are interrogated, you don't have an opportunity to substantiate what they say. They talk about secondhand information, about rumors. Undoubtedly, in some of that testimony, some people will be hurt. But I think you have to weigh that of maybe hurting some limited number of people against the overall public good. I have seen every document that was in our committee's files. My initials are on them. Uh, I have seen all the documents that I wanted to in the FBI and the CIA. If you think there's a smoking gun in our files or any of the government files, you're using illicit substances. You are, in a word, stoned. Pun intended. We now know from a CIA declassified document that Mr. Blakey was shown into the CIA file room there on Oswald. There's 15, 16 cabinets that he saw, and he didn't even look at them. And he said, he waved his hands, and he said, well, we'll seal those up until 2029. That was his reaction. He didn't even bother to look and read what was in those cabinets. And now, if you ask me, can this case still be solved? I would say, I suppose there's a possibility, but the trail is terribly cold. Many, many key witnesses have died. And I have the sense that this case is now toppling over the dusty borderline between current affairs and history. And it's about to become history, and perhaps quite unnecessarily, one of the most unsatisfactory pieces of history um, that American society will ever have to deal with. I think that the investigation should never have been regarded as officially closed and that indeed I don't think it should be officially closed today. What I think we should do is create right now uh, an office of special counsel on political assassinations, not just the assassination of President Kennedy, but uh, all political assassinations. As the Warren Commission was beginning its work in late 1963, Chief Justice Earl Warren was asked whether all the documents on the assassination would ever be made public. He answered, yes, there will come a time, but it might not be in your lifetime. Now, with interest in the Kennedy assassination reawakened, Americans do want to know more, and they want to know it in their lifetime. We may never solve the case, but at least the argument goes we deserve to see not some, but all the government files on the assassination. 
The critics argue further that if we cannot see all these documents, we deserve a meaningful explanation of what possible security issues could still exist to prohibit their release after all these years. I'm Bill Curtis. Join us again next week for another edition of Investigative Reports. This is a very dangerous and uncertain world. We would like to live uh, as we once lived, but history will not permit it. The balance of power is still on the side of freedom. We are still the keystone and the arch of freedom. And I think we will continue to do as we have done in our past, our duty 